So I am particularly honored in speaking to all of you today about ML286 EFN, as the 26th May marks the 80th anniversary of the commencement of Operation Dynamo in 1940. So this is very serendipitous indeed. Before I begin my talk with you today, I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank Mark Beatty Edwards and the Nautical Archaeology Society for this very kind invitation. I would also like to thank Dr. Anthony Firth, Director of Fjorda, for his generous sharing of knowledge and for being, for being such a continuous guiding light in my research of motor launches and ML286. I would also very much like to thank Stephen Wood of BJ Wood and Son Boatyard, who very kindly allowed me to visit his boatyard while I was an MA student and take numerous photos of ML286, Ethan, an example of which you can see right now in this current slide. And Stephen also very kindly allowed me to interview him, which led me to a very interesting discovery, which I will share with you all a little bit later today. My sincerest thanks as well to Paul Hollenby and Rupert Selby, who always very kindly allowed me to use their photographs of ML286 and Ethan from when she was a houseboat in the 1980s. And finally, my warmest and most sincerest thanks to all of you for tuning in today. I hope all of you and your loved ones are all safe and well during these difficult times. So to introduce myself to all of you, hello, my name is Suzanne Ray Taylor and I'm originally from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada and proudly Canadian and you can see I'm posing there with two of my Canadian friends. Um, I recently completed my MA in archaeological practice at Birkbeck University of London and I'm also a classically trained actress. And for many years, I volunteered and performed at the archaeological site of the Rose Playhouse on Bankside in London, which ultimately led to my research interest of engaging with archaeology through performance and creativity in an attempt to better understand and explore the vibrant biographies of material culture, which may also be entangled with the vibrant biographies of people. With regard to ML286, Ethan, this very important and spirited and evolving little motor launch helps me to better understand and further explore the vibrant biographies of vessels and how that may be entwined or entangled with the vibrant biographies of the people associated with those vessels. And so this afternoon, you and I can explore this idea together. So let's go meet ML286. I met a little motor launch. She was two years old, said she. Her hull was thick with barnacles, which stuck her to the key. And that was written by Gordon S. Maxwell, Lieutenant RNVR, and we'll learn a little bit more about Lieutenant Maxwell a little bit later on in this presentation. So there she is, looking so beautiful. Well, um, this presentation is going to explore four different areas of the vibrant biography of ML286. Uh, as you can see, she's hulked there um, at BJ Wooden Sun Boatyard. So, Firstly, this presentation will explore the birth or genesis of motor launches and their subsequent role as World War I submarine chasers, which our little ML286 would have been as well. Um, secondly, this presentation will explore ML286's new life as the renamed vessel Ethan and what we know or don't know about her in her new role as a Dunkirk little ship. And you can see her Dunkirk plaque just there in the right. Um, Thirdly, this presentation will explore ML286's evolved life as a houseboat in the 1970s and 1980s, firstly as a renamed vessel Cordon Rouge, and later as a renamed vessel uh, Eothen. And lastly, this presentation will explore the archaeology of ML286 as an abandoned vessel hulked between the dry dock of BJ Wood and Son Boatyard and the eight at Isleworth, West London. And you can see there she is hulked just to the right of your screen, the right photo, almost like a before and after shot um, of ML286. So this is where she's uh, hulked today. She does this just behind the dry dock there between the dry dock at, and the 8. And if you haven't been to Isleworth 8 before, I highly recommend you visit. Lots of very lovely scenic things to do. And if you're a fan of Anglo-Saxon fish traps, well, Isleworth 8 has a very beautiful one for you to look at, and that is at particularly low tide back in September 2019. So I mentioned Lieutenant Gornes Maxwell of the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve, and he was also commander of ML314, which leads me to return to the idea of how vibrant biographies and vessels may be entangled with the vibrant biographies of the people associated with those vessels. And so today, not only will you be hearing my voice, but you will be hearing the voices of some of the people associated with either the Motor Launch Patrol or with ML286 or Ethan, as this is their story and their personal experiences and memories to share with all of you today. 
And um, this is a photo here of uh, Lieutenant uh, Eric P. Dawson. He was a member of the RNVR. He was a Canadian who had a great account about his experiences in book called Pushing Water. And there's uh, the motor launch patrol by Gordon S. Maxwell. And you will also hear some lovely motor launch poetry written by Lieutenant Gordon S. Maxwell or Tennyson Maxwell, as he called himself, and poems by Rupert Brooke, who was commissioned in the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve, but while serving with the British Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, developed sepsis from an infected mosquito bite and died on St. George's Day, 23rd of April, 1915, and he's buried on the Greek island of Skyros. And if the spirit be not there, why its fragrance in the hair? And I love beginning um, my talk with this photo and that lovely quote from Rupert Brooke, because you can sort of think of ML286 as having a spirit and the, even the branches in the trees sort of being her, her hair. And I believe ML286, you know, has this new voice of birdsong and wind, airplanes, volunteers and visitors to the site and the boatyard workers, all in her new and current landscape of dry dock and aid. So let's see if we can just listen to her voice. So there she is in action, our beautiful little Emerald Sweet Six. And and here are the trees. So we've got new voices to Emerald Sweet Six. We've got the wind. You can hear a little bit of the airplanes and the birds. We're coming up to a little bit of the, the dry dock there. And again, you know, the branches being sort of part of her hair and who she is today. So we're going to be looking at a lot of photographs of her as a whole vessel throughout this presentation. So that's our little, our little video. So as ML286 is a very muddy site, if you don't want to get your paws wet, I suggest you grab your wellies because we're going to the movies. And action. And why the movies, you ask? I'm so glad you did. Dub the movies because of their activity in a sea way. Ubiquitous MLs earn the title in a better sense because of their never ending activity in performing all sorts of nasty jobs for which they were never intended. There's something about this name, movie, which seems to fit, for the ML is nothing if not movement. Her movement is more like a drunken streak of lightning. You require sea legs, sea arms head and a kind of armor plated stomach well described as the dreadnought type. The motion of a movie is something utterly strange and different even to the best sailorman. There is no languid roll or pitch. It is a series of unexpected leaps or bounds. And what's in a name Shakespeare asks us. Well they were known as of course motor launches, MLs, movies, such fins, the Grey Patrol, the Mosquito Fleet, the fringes of the fleet, the stink pot, the special, and the semi-submersible. And with regards to our ML286, she was also known as Cordon Rouge, Eothin. She is a veteran of World War I and World War II, and she has courage, personality, charm, zest, vibrancy. She's a spirited vessel. She's dynamic. And there's a great romance about ML286. In the whole history of shipbuilding, there has been nothing more romantic in conception and achievement than the mosquito fleet of submarine chasers, or MLs, as the British call them. And that's by um, Henry R. Sutphin, who is the managing director of ELCO. So the birth or genesis of the movie. So the menace of German submarine warfare becomes increasingly grave. And in February 1915, the commission of British engineers, along with a well-known English shipbuilder and ordnance expert, Sir Trevor Dawson, managing director of Vickers Armament Works and representative of the Admiralty arrive in New York. And they go and inspect the Standard Motor Construction Company. And there's a subsequent meeting with Henry R. Sutphin, again, the managing director of the Electric Launch Company. My idea was to have a mosquito fleet big enough to thoroughly patrol the waters of Great Britain, each of them carrying a quick firing gun. I said my preference was for a type of about 80 feet in length with a speed of some 19 knots. So on the 9th of April, 1915, a contract is signed for 50 70-foot MLs to be delivered in one year's time, the designer being Irwin Chase. But due to the neutrality of the United States, Sutton decides MLs are to be prefabricated at Elko Shipbuilding Yard in Bayonne, New Jersey, and assembled in Quebec, Canada. Timbers for the boats were cut and shipped in Bayonne and delivered by train to Quebec for assembly. Frames, knees, heels, decks, wiring harnesses, fittings, machinery were all sent to Canada. 
Now, on the 1st of May, you've got the master or pattern boat in the frame at Elko, but also you have the civilian ocean liner, the Lusitania, sailing her last voyage. And very sadly, on the 7th of May, you have the sinking of the Lusitania by German U-boat, by German U-boat, resulting in nearly 2,000 deaths. So Sutphin receives a cablegram from the Admiralty ordering 500 additional Sutphins, and all 550 motor launches are to be completed by the 15th of November 1916. And on the 9th of July 1915, a new contract is signed. So 500 new MLs, B80 footers, and in 488 days. So the shipbuilding yard in Quebec is enlarged and an additional one is added. So you've got the Canadian Vickers Limited in Montreal and the Davy Shipbuilding and Repairing Company in Quebec. And these men were ordinary woodworkers, but um, you know, they assembled with the greatest possible ease and dispatch. And Rupert Brooks says, is there any city in the world that stands so nobly as Quebec? The citadel crowns a headland 300 feet high that juts boldly out into the St. Lawrence. What is it in the South Eclipse? Shadows soft and passingly about the corners of her lips the smile that is essential she. And I cleaned every single one of, you know, her bit of a smile there with a toothbrush back in May, 2017. It's true that they are fabricated, not built, but each boat has its own personality. And the commander of one chaser can tell at a glance each one of the other boats and who commands her. Every movie has a personality. On this particular day, our movie seemed to be beating up doing music from her throbbing engines. And each boat was fitted with two 220 horsepower standard engines. And the, the parts were built to sample drawings and specifications, and this gave absolute interchangeability of parts. And so this is part of the success of the um, standardization. The bronze struts used to hold the shafts as well as the quadrants and rudders were made by the Tiffany Studio Company. All deliveries were made at the launching slips in the St. Lawrence River. After the first 50, ice brings this to a halt. So the Emmas are shifted by rail to open port in Halifax, Nova Scotia, with a trial run with a skeleton or terrible lizard um, ML model over a thousand mile stretch of, of railway between Quebec and Halifax. In total, 84 boats sent over um, rail routes. And so the MLs are towed away in storage basins, and each ship carries four MLs, and a fleet of 130 transports was required for all 550 MLs and their spare and standardized parts, and all 550 arrived safely. And um, so the MLs attract the attention of French and Italians, so you get large orders placed for standard motors and completed vessels, bringing the total number of MLs up to 720. So the fighting equipment of a movie. They've got a short caliber three inch gun using a shell weighing approximately 13 pounds. They've got a depth bomb containing 250 pounds of TNT and lance bombs, 14 pound bombs on the end of a four and a half foot um, handle for fighting submarines at close range. So their roles, patrolling for submarines, sweeping for mines in the channels ahead of ships, convoying merchant vessels, and towing deadly Q-type paravane for lurking submarines and laying of mines, um, which they were referred to as eggs. And they were also used for hunting U-boats, and for that they worked with the seaplanes and blimps, and all MLs carried portable directional hydrophones accurate enough to tell the listener within about two degrees the direction of the approach of any sort of vessel. The listener was trained to eliminate everything but the sound of the submarine. Now, their biggest sort of moment of glory came on the raid of the Zeebrugger and uh, Ostend in April and May 1918. So it was the 23rd of April in 1918, but there was a previous attempt um, on the 11th of April. And the aim was to block the Bruce Ship Canal at Zeebrugger and Ostend Harbour with old cruisers filled with cement. So you've got Thetis and Intrepid and Ithiania as the block ships. And the main task of the MLs and the coastal motor boats was to provide a smoke screen to shield the approach of the assault vessels. We've got Vindictive, Iris, and Daffodil. And the MLs were also to rescue the crews of the, of the block ship. So we've got ML526 rescuing the Thetis crew, ML282 rescuing the crews of Intrepid and Iphigenia, and the crew of the destroyer war. Um, it requires courage of no mean order to stand on the unprotected deck of a frail wooden craft and go steadily on into enemy port under a murderous fire and go alongside a ship that is being hammered by half a dozen shore batteries as the block ships were hammered by the German guns. So 
simultaneously with Zeebrugge, um, you've got the raid on Ostend. So the block ships are brilliant and, and serious, but there's a failure of the block ships to find a narrow entrance between the piers. This was due to the shifting of Strumbank Boy by the Germans and the wind shifting from north to southwest, carrying smokescreen across the harbor and obstructing the view. So brilliant and serious collide. So um, you've got ML276 rescuing the crew of Brilliant and ML283 rescuing the crew of Sirius. And then you've got the second more successful effort to block Ostend Harbor on the 9th of May, 1918. The first RNVR officer killed was senior um, ML officer, Lieutenant Commander Dauber and Young in command of the first ML to approach the mole with the purpose of laying flares to, to guide the block ships in. And this little book of poetry was really the result of um, the Zeebrugge concert that happened in the wardroom of MS, HMS Arrogant um, the night before um, they went into action. Um, the second officer killed was Lieutenant Oswald Robinson. Um, his ML-424 was hit while, um, while off the mole and the shell struck the bridge and his body was never recovered. Lieutenant Oswald Robinson will be missed by all, and his cheery personality is a great loss to our little fleet. And if you look at the at the concert um, poster, you can see um, uh, at 9 p.m. April 21st, Dr. Livingstone and Professor D.B. Robinson in their magical mysteries, Oswald, the great impersonator. And here you've got um, Tennyson Maxwell as, again, our Gordon S. Maxwell. Only a few days before the action, he was one of the principal performers in a concert we got up in the wardroom of Arrogant. He was a wonderfully clever mimic and actor, and his impersonations were the making of that concert. To his young wife, the sympathy of all of us goes out very fully and very sincerely. And Gordon S. Maxwell used to like to set his music to po uh, his poems to music of the day. So a perfect night. He sent to the tune of A Perfect Day by Carrie Jacobs Bond. So it goes a little something like this. Well, this is the end of a perfect night, near the end of our ML frail. And our cabin looked like a cistern burst in the midst of a jumble sail. But we never dream of the glory gained, or the PSOs will win. But sad we think as we gaze all round, what a hell of a mess we're in. And there we have uh, the Zeebrugger Conference, the centenary, a wonderful um, conference. And Dr. Anthony Furt gave a fantastic talk um, about the um, motor launch's role in, in the Zeebrugger and Ostend raid. So, what was life like in the movies? I remember, I remember those first days on patrol when Guy the Subs had yet to learn how MLs pitch and roll. The jet black night, the days of fog, the gales near steering strife. We didn't get much comfort, but my hat, we did see life. They were built for speed, not for comfort. Everything is dwarfed except the horsepower, just room to move around and nothing more. Forward are the crew's quarters, where with a marvelous economy of space, seven men live and sleep in 20 feet of space. In a wardroom where two can turn around and three becomes a crush. Crushed in somewhere midships between the engine room, the gloriously named wardroom is the galley, taking a space of about four feet athwartship. I'm afraid I cannot tell in restrained tones of that sinkhole of iniquity in the galley with its intonabulation of shifting pots and pans and burning concoctions flung in a heavy sea over paraffin burners. Button tight the oilskin coat, towel round the neck. We will have the sea tonight washing down the deck. It's choppy in the channel, so it's easy to foretell that we will have a rotten time in HMSML. Our days when, however much you may wrap yourself up in oilskins, you will still get soaked and your sea boots act as involuntary foot baths of ice cold water. Toward midday, the wind abates a little, but not so the cold, and oilskins give place to double coats, thick wool, yellowy brown coats with hoods, and which, if worn with these turned up in baggy trousers of the same material, gives the appearance of a ship manned by giant teddy bears. Sing the song of a frail ML, may the Lord have mercy upon us. Rolling about in an oily swell, may the Lord have mercy upon us. Out on a high explosive spree, petrol, lighter, and TNT, looking for you both 303. May the Lord 
have mercy upon us. On a lonesome patrol, sometimes it's very hard to keep before you the vision that you are just one cog in the greatest piece of organized and perfect machinery ever made the British Navy. The monotony of the daily routine, unless you fight against it, will sap into your reserve of courage. The courage that we are called upon to give is the courage to keep cheerful and endure. Night patrol is a wonderful place for thought. There is nothing else to do as you stand on the bridge, wrapped in a double coat, sucking at your pipe, and gazing over the black waste of waters, trying to pierce the darkness that surrounds you like a curtain. It has been said, and very truly, that it was the long and weary watches of the British Navy that won the war, for three quarters of the sailors' life and wartime is spent on watching and waiting. The other quarter is fierce excitement. Save petrol is a strict injunction given to movie officers, hence we must do a drifting patrol as much as possible, shutting off your engines, setting a watch, and drifting with the current, tide, and wind for hours together. The movie takes the sea broadside and you spend your time rolling for the whole of your drifting patrol. This is no gentle sleep inducing roll either. Every attempt in the gallery dances to two step, rolls and sets up a monotonous orchestration of crashing, crashing and tapping. If you are in your bunk, you must wedge yourself securely there or you will roll out. Any roll worth rolling is worth rolling well, is the motto of our drifting patrol. But of all the ways and means of amusement provided for us aboard a movie, nothing can touch our gramophone. Every day our gratitude goes out to the Canadian lady who provided us with our music box. So what of our brave movie crew? They were called Brooms of the Fleet, Harry Tate Navy, Pushing Water, Auxiliary Motor Boat Patrol. A nobleman notary now be enough, a banker, a butcher, a baker, a drover, a dentist, a dustman, a duke, a cabman, a candlestick maker, a sacristan, and sideman, a shoe black, a smith, a slather, surveyor, a stoker, a stevedore, shoemaker, sexton, a sweep, a banker, a brewer, a broker, a grocer, a gardener, a golfer, a groom, a carter, a cooper, a chauffeur, a plumber, a potman, a plowman, a peer, a lawyer, a lounger, a loafer, a ventriloquist, vocalist, valley, a vet, a barrister, bailiff, a butler, a carpenter, clerk, a contractor, a chef, conductor, coal heaver, and cutler. Bird was a porter on Darlington Station, Smith in private life as a plumber in London. Jones was an artist for calendars chiefly. I simply mention this that you may realize that our sailors are distinctly civilian sailors. The last member of our crew is grimy. The name itself needs no explanation. So what was movie training like at Southampton? Max and Gums at first tied us up in as much of a knot as we tied the cartridge belting. Semaphore we found we had once we learned the alphabet be simply a matter of practice. The same may be said of Morse with the lamp, not flags, far harder to learn and far easier to forget. An officer upon a movie in time becomes an expert in numerous things. He is usually his own signaler upon the semaphore, the Morse lamp and the flags, besides being general utility man about the ship. So HMS Hermione was the old cruiser, that was their mothership, and HMS Vernon in Portsmouth is where explosives were studied, depth chargers, lance bombs, detonators, indicator nets, and Great Horsey Island for experiments of land and underwater explosives. HMS Fiskard is for the engineering course. They had an exam after one week. HMS Excellent, Whale Island, most famous gunnery school in the world. And the course consisted of a 13-pound gun drill, um, rifle and revolver instruction and firing, range finding, and miniature moving target firing. There's a picture there of HMS Fiskard. The romantic personal element in which a war fought largely by kid reservists in small boats is bound to be rich. So Lieutenant Dawson had the job of censoring the crew's letters home, touched to read that the letters commenced, I am in the pink. I guarantee that 80% of the letters written from this movie commence that way. This is the romance of the penny stamp and the miracle of the scribbled letter. There is a romance too about the strange journeys of letters to those um, at sea in wartime. Hand in hand with the average sailor's unconscious uh, of bravery is his absolute unconsciousness of danger. We have a job to do. Well, then, let's do it. He is after no cheap heroics and will do deeds daily, which would make a landsman gasp and think nothing of it. A man who loses his life on patrol, say a deckhand, dies just as much for his country and for those he loves at home as one who meets his end laying a gun on a super dreadnought during the greatest naval battle in history. And now we come to Lieutenant Jeffrey Stephen Olfrey, who's commander of our ML-286. And you can see it's a little bit blurry, but ML-286, he was commanded in December um, 1916 until the 21st of September 1917. 
And there's a, a wonderful photo there of Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey, looking very handsome. And he was also a war artist. These are two of his uh, beautiful illustrations of motor launches, motor launch engaging a submarine and motor launches. I leapt upon the rock and clasped the sea maid in my arms, for I was quite enchanted by the sweetness of her charms. So on the 29th of September, Lieutenant Alfrey is commander of ML247, part of a four-boat four flotilla. It enters into St. Ives Bay, where gale force winds, and ML247 develops engine trouble. It hits or rock and blows up on impact, and all crew members, including Lieutenant Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey, are killed except one. What are those distant shapes dimly ahead? Brave ships that fought and fell, brave men who died. Shadows of yesterday living though dead, sleeping eternally under the tide. Say a boat strikes a mine or runs into a gale, she may be lost with all hands or perhaps only one or two escape. The fact if reported in the papers, and it probably would not be, is counted as not by the general public. The public know little of our life. They said that the dead die not, remain near to the rich heirs of their grief and mirth. So Lieutenant Jeffrey Stephen Alfie's body was never found. He died at the age of 29, survived by his wife, Alice Maud Mary, daughter Stephanie, who later became a, an illustrator in her own right, and his unborn child, Rosemary. He's commemorated at the Portsmouth Naval Memorial and on the Birchington and Acol War Memorial in Kent. And I'm very grateful to my friend, David Jarman, for taking these photographs for me. And you can see Lieutenant Alfie's name just at the top there. Dawn was theirs in sunset and the colors of the earth. Um, also, we have Samuel William Salmon, a Canadian, and he was actually serving with uh, Lieutenant Alfrey on ML-286, initially as a sub-lieutenant from November 1916. Uh, and then he's promoted to Tempe, uh, or Tempe, lieutenant and reappointed on promotion as lieutenant of ML-286. And he's commander of ML-96 uh, on the 10th of July, 1918. And over 3,000 Canadians served with Britain's Royal Navy. ML-286 would have been sold off between late 1919 and 1924, when only eight of the MLs were still in military service. ML-286 became Cordon Rouge in private hands, and then in 1930, Ethan, which was still her name, at Dunkirk. And there's her Dunkirk plaque, and so now we come to, of course, Operation Dynamo. And there we've got um, her wheel, again, a close-up of her Dunkirk plaque. You can sort of see it right there, right beside her wheel to the left-hand side. So it was called the Miracle of Dunkirk, or known as the Miracle of Dunkirk, with the rescue of more than 338,000 British and French soldiers from the French port of Dunkirk. Sunday, the 26th of May, 1940, Operation Dynamo begins with Vice Admiral Ramsey's signal at 6.57 p.m. The last British troops evacuated on the third French force forces covering um, their escapes, and all resistance in Dunkirk ended on the 4th of June, 1940, at 9.30 a.m. We shall fight on the beaches. Here was only a fleet of ships, lifeboats and motor yachts, of Dutch scoots and French fishing boats, British coasters and channel ferries, of drifters, minesweepers, sloops, destroyers, the strangest fleet in the history of war upon the sea. The Ministry of War Transport includes Ethan in its list of small craft utilized in Operation Dynamo. Not all reached Ramsgate. Those that reached Ramsgate, not all reached Dunkirk, but the list stands for the basic list for the operation. She was returned to Ramsgate and towed to Teddington by Tufts from where she was requisitioned for service as an auxiliary patrol vessel in the Thames. Found to be unsuitable, she was returned to her owners in August 1940. And this is just an example of just the humility of the people involved in Operation Dynamo. I do not consider I did any more than my duty. So movie afterlife. There's a picture of her in the 1980s as a houseboat. My thanks to Paul Hollenby and Rupert Selby for these photos. And a lovely photograph there of her binnacle, again of her wheel. Ethan wasn't a houseboat when Peter and Carol Barnes owned her. They lived in a house on the Thames and kept her at the bottom of their garden. It was really my parents were friends with uh, Carol and Peter. I was only a schoolboy at the time. That's David Knight, the honorary secretary of the Association of Dunkirk Little Ship. Me and three of my friends used to work for the couple who owned this little ship. She was moored on the Thames in Old Windsor, opposite the Bells of Oosley Public House. When I said we worked, we were all about 15 years old back in the summer of 1978. Oops. Um, um, the owners, who were Ron and Greta Gill, had a boat hire service, and we would take charge of the rentals through our summer holidays from school. 
all for free as it was such good fun. When Ron and Greta Gill purchased her in 1973-1974, they did live on her, but she was still a serviceable vessel with all her original fixtures and fittings. She was sold on in the late 1970s, and that's when things started to go downhill. It was a houseboat in Windsor, and somebody bought it, brought it here to be worked on. They worked on it doing wood and planking. When it came here, it never left. It was sold a few times, I believe, while it was in the yard, and families moved on it and moved off. And then the last family just left overnight and disappeared. And then we ended up with it. And that's Stephen Wood from BJ Wood and Son Boatyard. And some more photographs of her wheel. Now, this is Stephen's wheel today. So when I was interviewing Stephen Wood back in December 2017, he said that his father had sold off parts of uh, ML286. And so I tracked it down. And there we do have the before and after photos. They grow in beauty side by side. They fill the yard with glee. They are the very latest word of motor luxury. And I was so excited to see the original wheel of uh, Ethan that Rupert Selby very kindly took my, my photograph of me um, at the wheel. And this is her original binnacle also um, on the same uh, houseboat in Chelsea Harbor. And again, <clears throat> my, my thanks to uh, Rupert Selby. So moving on to our last bit, movie archaeology, we are gadgets too, part of the naval machine. That's what we all are. She had a weary, tired air as if her health were bad. Her stem had lately come unglued. Her paintwork made me sad. So is the movie ML286 a creative combination of watching and waiting and fierce excitement? Well, how did the archaeology sort of come about with this vessel? Well, Dr. Anthony Firth, director of Fjorda, contacted the Thames Discovery Program a few years ago, inquiring about the possible existence of the remains of a World War I motor launch at the boat yard, um, at a boatyard at Isleworth. This was confirmed by the TDP, and so since May 2017, I've been volunteering, cleaning, and recording ML286, and I wrote my first essay about her for my, for my master's degree at Birkbeck. And when I found out about her partial Canadian identity, I was completely taken in by her, but it was really love at first sight. And you can see that um, ML286 is a part of the landscape, and the landscape is a part of her. And because we had a challenge um, of, you know, all this mud, it, it sort of carried over into when we were trying to make a 3D movie. So this was back in um, June 2019. So we had to clear ML286 of vegetation. Um, we were working with Professor Pablo Rodriguez Navarro from the University of Valencia and his colleague Giorgio Verdiani of the University of Florence. So they were doing some photogrammetry and laser scanning. We've got 2D elevations and 3D, uh, 3D model constructed. And there's the little website if you want to see that model, which I would show you, but I'm running out of time. Um, so here we have the baseline. And really, um, a part of, of doing um, the archaeology was to really um, look more closely at her construction. And we wanted to um, really differentiate between the softwood fittings of uh, this vessel from when she was, um, of course, uh, a, a submarine chaser to her, her hardwood from when she was, um, you know, transformed into a, a houseboat. And, and so we've got a, a really nice a close up. Uh, of her uh, details and her um, different features there. And for if the soul be not in place, what is laid trouble in her face and sits there, nothing where and wise behind the curtains of her eyes. There we've got the porthole there, really lovely close up. And oh, so we discovered that one of the volunteers, um, Clive, he discovered the capstan. And then by the end of our sort of seven day um, cleaning and excavation and recording of her. Um, we had a really lovely clear view of that uh, capstan. So again, you know, this helps us to better understand her constructional detail. Um, and again, to um, understand the difference between um, what she was like when she was a, a submarine chaser and she was repurposed as a houseboat. So there we have uh, her collapsed deck there. So uh, let's go to the movies. On the 21st of July, 2019, ML286 is filmed for BBC4 series, uh, Digging for Britain. And um, the program aired on the 4th of December, 2019. And it was shown again just this past March in 2020, which you can catch up on, BBC iPlayer. And you can see the work that we did in July. 
for sight and sounds, dreams, happy as your day, and laughter, learn to friends and gentleness and hearts at peace under an English heaven. And so these are my friends, uh, Gabrielle and the earlier um, picture show Samantha, and they were confiding into me and, and sharing really their feelings of ML286. I was surprised and interested to hear about its identity and excited to have an opportunity to be a part of it. It was satisfying to see the color of the wood and grain. Um, I think it summons up associations of feelings and memories and our history recalls World War I and World War II and what those conflicts meant to the lives of my parents and grandparents. When, her, when she sleeps her soul, I know, those who wander on the air, wings where I may never go, leaves her lying still and fair, waiting limp, empty, laid aside, like a dress upon a chair. It's like, oh, let's try to save our little ML286. Let's not leave her lying uh, empty. Um, hopefully, maybe we can raise some money to do at least a partial excavation of her, maybe save her transom and, and help to tell her really vibrant, spirited story. So here's some very useful links. There's not time to go through them all, but if you rewatch on um, YouTube, you can catch them. A uh, little bit of a bibliography there. And um, acknowledgements, again, just thank you, Mark Beatty Edwards, uh, the Nautical Archaeology Society, Dr. Anthony Bertha Fjord, and so many others. This is dedicated to all those who served in Motor Launch Patrol and to all those who served in Operation Dynamo and to their ships. And on a personal note, this is dedicated in loving memory of Captain Jennifer Casey of the Canadian Forces Snowbirds. Uh, tragically, um, Captain Casey uh, was uh, killed uh, in an aircraft cash, uh, crash in Kamloops, British Columbia, during Operation Inspiration on the 17th of May, 2020. And she was the public affairs officer for the Canadian Forces Snowbirds. And for Nova Scotia, the lovely province uh, in Canada that suffered a lot of heartbreak recently, especially with the loss of Captain Jennifer Casey. So this leads me now to introduce next week's fantastic speaker, Ziad M. Morsi, and he's going to talk to us about tragedy, the Egyptian traditional riverine tangible and intangible heritage rescue project. And I can't wait to hear all about that. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening.